Well, I'm excited to open the word with you all this morning and also to start a new series today on the book of 2 Timothy. I don't know how much you all have studied this book, but I pray that the Lord will bless us through this study. And I know he will. Because all of scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for us. As it says in 2 Timothy. So would you all open to 2 Timothy right now? This New Testament book. And would you all pray as I'm preaching for me? And pray that the Lord truly blesses us and opens our hearts today to hear his word <clears throat> and that this these 40 minutes or so is not a vain time but that he really teaches us how desperately do we need his word how desperately do we need to grow through his word second timothy I'm just going to read chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And you can start to get a flavor for this incredible epistle of Paul. Let's read. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, beloved son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this letter is all about you. And may our lives be all about you. And Lord, right now I just ask for your help to preach. And I ask that you send your spirit and help everybody who sits here. Help all of my dear brothers and sisters to listen to your word and to be changed by it. And Lord, we all want to confess today that we are not here to listen to Sam. We're not here to listen to the thoughts of man. We are here to study your word and to hear from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. And so, Lord, would you send a Berean spirit among all of us today that everybody would search the scriptures and see if the things that I'm saying today are true in the scriptures. Lord, let those who speak speak as the oracles of God. Let us hear your word Lord, let us be staggered by your word. Let us be astounded by your word. Let us be changed by your word. 
Lord, show us the desperate state of our hearts today. Show us what we need. Show us that man cannot live by bread alone. But we must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's not enough for us to go on every week just making money and, and eating our, our meals and having our entertainment. Lord, we need you, and we need to hear from you, and we need to devour your word, and we need to be soaked in your word, Lord. Please help us today. Please help us to, to develop a hunger for your word and to see that everything else in life is nothing. Give us Christ today, Lord. Give us a dear love for our church, for our families, for all that is good and godly. Lord, help us today. And I know we will be helped. Amen. The letter of 2 Timothy has the colors of a lion. First, think of the lion's, the underside of its mane, that dark, dirty, uh, brown color. This letter is like dirt brown. It's intensely practical. Paul is going to talk here about stuff that matters day in, day out. Just the brown of practical life. And then think of the gold of the lion's mane and the lion's fur. This letter is full of the gold of heaven. One of Paul's favorite phrases in this letter is that day. He's looking forward to that day. He talks about the kingdom. He talks about the appearing of Christ. And he's always conscious of heaven in this letter. And then finally, think of the blood that comes when the lion gets hold of an antelope. And the blood comes streaming out. John Calvin said of 2 Timothy that this letter was written in Paul's blood. It wasn't written with ink. It was written when Paul knew he was about to die in a Roman prison. And he's spilling out his lifeblood for us here. He's telling us about the most vital things that matter in life. The colors of a lion. Brown and gold and red. 2 Timothy is often considered to be a pastoral epistle. So it's taken with 1 Timothy and Titus. Why? Because Paul is talking to pastors there. And he's encouraging them. And he's telling them what to do in churches. But 2 Timothy has a, a bit of a different flavor from the other two. It's more than just a pastoral letter. We could say a few things about it. Firstly, it is a personal letter. It's dripping with personal care for Timothy. He's deeply concerned with Timothy's heart. So it's not only pastoral, it's also personal. And it's not only pastoral and personal, it's also paternal. Look in verse 1, in verse 2. Paul talks to who in verse 2? Timothy his beloved son. Nowhere in this letter does he actually call Timothy fellow pastor or church leader or something like that. He refers to Timothy as his son. And so this is a paternal letter. And then finally, this is a psychological letter. I think of all of Paul's letters, this is one in which he says the most about the state of the human heart. He really tells us what the Christian heart should look like, how we should not fear, how we should interact with each other, how we should interact with the world. And whatever you want to call that, the world has many different terms for it, the, the unconscious, the subconscious, 
We could talk about our conscience, our heart, our mind. Paul is, is deeply concerned with those things in this letter. So it's pastoral, it's personal, it's paternal, and it is psychological. And then I want to show you one more thing about this letter just as we get started in studying it today. <clears throat> this letter is also very general. So Paul is not only talking to Timothy or to one other person, but he's also talking to the whole church of God. So you all listening to me? We could make a mistake here and, and say, okay, Paul is just talking to Timothy, and this letter is only for pastors, and it doesn't really apply to me. But we want to see, for example, Paul is always going to turn around and look at the congregation. For example, in verse 9, he'll speak of us. So all of a sudden, he's talking about everyone. In chapter 3, verse 12, he speaks of all. And he says, all who desire to live godly. And then we'll see him throughout the letter praying for other people. So not just talking to Timothy, but for many people. And look at the final verse of this whole letter right now as we get started in studying it. Chapter 4, verse 22. This is fascinating, and it's a little bit almost spooky to me how Paul does this. 4, verse 22. He says, The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And right there, the your is singular. So he's talking to Timothy. Okay, If you have a, a King James Bible, it should say, Be with thy spirit. It's singular. One person. Right? So he's just talking to Timothy, and then what does he say? Grace be with you. And that's you, plural. Do you all see that? So you can imagine it this way. Do you all know that, that movie, My Dinner with Andre? There are just two people sitting at a table. It's a really silly movie. And it just films them for an hour and a half having a discussion at the table. And there's a brief moment where one of the characters looks into the, looks into the camera. And breaks the fourth wall, right? And then you know, oh, wait a second. This discussion is for us. They know we're watching. That's what Paul does right here. He's talking to Timothy. And right at the end, he says, grace be with all of you. He knows we're all watching. This letter is for all of us. You all see that? It's like if a father and son were talking at, at the lunch table. And the whole time, they're talking to each other, but they know everybody else is listening, right? And so, that's what Paul is doing here. He's being very personal. He's instructing Timothy. And through doing that, he's instructing the whole church. Now, let's go back to verses 1 and 2 for today's study. <clears throat> and verses 1 and 2 are simply Paul's greeting. He's just saying hello to Timothy, really. Let's read it again, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In verse 1, there's something very striking. There's a phrase there that doesn't appear in any of Paul's other greetings. Do you all notice that? He says, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. That phrase doesn't appear anywhere else in the greetings of Paul's epistles. So why does it appear here? And then I, I want you to notice something else here. He says, according to the promise of life. That's a little Greek word that we can just jump over quickly when we're reading our Bibles. According to. We say, okay, according to the promise of life. Moving on. I want to read another verse. But there's something very deep right there. That word according to in the Greek is kata. Let's just learn one Greek word today. Is that all right with you all? We'll learn it together. Okay. Say it after me. Kata. 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 Very nice. This Greek word is really important. It appears throughout this letter. What it means is 
in exact accordance with. So it's, it's a little stronger than the English according to. It means this thing locks up with this thing. And in the Greek, it actually literally comes from the word for down. So it's like in English when we say, I'm, I'm down with that. I'm good with that. Something like that. Or there's an old uh, Bonnie Raitt song, and it's called uh, Right Down the Line. And so she's, she's saying, like, when I think about you, I've been thinking about you my whole life, right down the line, it's just you, right? That's what the Greek here means, kata. It means in exact accordance. Everything lines up with this, okay? I want to show you this. This is so important. Look at chapter 2, verse 5. Has anyone here ever competed in athletics? I was on the lacrosse team in high school, but I got kicked off. That's a story for lunchtime. <laughs> Never matter. Uh, chapter 2, verse 5, it's about athletics. Look at this. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. That's kata. That's that same word, okay? So it means you got to be right in line with the rules, right? You can't take a little bit of steroids on the side, right? You have to be according to the rules. That's so important. So go back to chapter 1, verse 1. And the thought here is, Paul is writing, and everything he says revolves around that axis of what? According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. He's saying, Timothy, I'm speaking to you, and all that I'm going to talk about is according to the promise of life. Everything I'm going to talk about lines up with the promise of life. That's so important. And so today we're just going to study this greeting in the time we have. And this greeting tells us what to expect from Paul's letter, but it also tells us how this promise of life should affect us. It, it, it shows us Paul greeting young Timothy and saying, Look, Timothy, at the center of my life is the promise of life in Christ Jesus. And that ought to be an example for you. That ought to be how you live. In effect, he's already goading Timothy on and saying, Timothy, at the center of your life, do you have the promise of life in Christ Jesus? Do you all see that? So let's study this, and I have four things to say about this promise of life. The first thing is that life produces purpose. This promise of life produces purpose. Look again at verse 1. He said, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, what is according to the promise of life? The first part, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Let's get the scenario here. Where is Paul? Look at chapter 1, verse 16. It said that Onesiphorus was not ashamed of Paul's chain. That gives us a hint that Paul is writing with chains around his arms. Okay? Look at chapter 1, verse 15. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me. Okay, so he's got chains on his arms, and all of his friends in Asia have abandoned him. And what else can we see? Look at chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Chapter 4, 6 and 7. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. What's he saying there? I can see my death is right around the corner. So Paul is writing this letter in a Roman prison, having been abandoned by all of his friends with death right on the horizon. And how does he start the letter? You could imagine he could write to Timothy and say, Timothy, what am I going to do? I'm in prison. I'm scared. I, I don't know. 
I don't know what's going to happen. Will you help me? Does he write like that? No, what does he say? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He's in chains. His friends have abandoned him. And he's saying, I'm right in the middle of the will of God. I'm an apostle. My life has purpose. I know who I am by the grace of God. You all see that? Now, what is an apostle? This word is used 79 times in the New Testament. And in five of those times, it means simply a messenger. Someone who's sent out by Christ. It could mean a, a general messenger of the churches. Like when we speak today of, for example, our brother Robert. He's a missionary. He's a messenger of the churches, right? That you, this word is used five times in the New Testament in that way. But in all the other of the 79 times, it refers to the specific office of apostle. So those original 12 men plus one, Paul, who were the apostles of Jesus Christ, sent out to do what? To preach his word, to teach his word, to bring his word to the Gentiles. So Paul has this special calling from the Lord himself. And then he says what? By the will of God. And the Greek there is very, very direct. It's, it's actually through the will of God. It's like he's looking through a tunnel. And Paul can say, my life goes right through that tunnel of the will of God. I know that all I do goes through the tunnel of the will of God. And how does he know that? One commentator said that right here, pulsing in Paul's mind always is his moment on Damascus. Paul is always thinking back to that moment where he was struck down by the Lord on Damascus. And he said, Lord, and he came to know Jesus as Lord. And then what else is Paul doing? Paul's life is always spent trying to know that he is in the will of God. He'll even say to Timothy in chapter 3, verse 10, Timothy, you've been watching me and you've seen my purpose. He uses that word there, purpose. My life is full of purpose. I'm living it all to the will of God. So my point number one here is that life produces purpose. Now, can we all say, Sam, an apostle of Jesus Christ? No. No. We can't say that. That apostolic office has ended. There are not apostles in the sense that Paul was an apostle still walking this earth at all. But we can have Paul's sense of purpose, can't we? We could say, I am Sam, a saint of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And I'm called to holiness. I'm called to be set apart to God. And I know the will of God for my life. Or what else could we say? We could say, I am a carpenter by the will of God, to the glory of Christ Jesus. I am a student by the will of God, to the glory of Christ Jesus. And we can pray in such a way and live in such a way that everything we do in our life, we're saying, runs right down that barrel of the will of God. I have purpose. I know who I am. I know that what I'm doing today is full of the promise of life in Christ Jesus. And that's how Paul is going to instruct Timothy to live here. He's going to say, Timothy, don't just live in some flabby way where you could just, I guess I'll go to work and I'll complain sometimes and I'll do this and I'll complain sometimes. He's calling Timothy to see God's purpose in every moment of his life. Second point. Life is a promise. So look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And then what does he say? According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. What I'm doing, Timothy, locks up perfectly with the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. 
Here's a question for you. What is a promise? What does this mean? The promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. A promise is whenever someone says, I will do something. Okay? Let's say you spring a leak in your bathroom and it's flooding all over the floor and you've got a big emergency and there's a problem and you need someone to help and you call me and I say, I can't be there right now, but I can be there tomorrow at 4 p.m. I'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m., right? I've made now a promise to you, right? Now let's think about that. What happens when someone makes a promise like that to you? A lot of things go on in the back of our minds that we might not think about. We start to say, well, is this person actually trustworthy? Do I trust Sam? And then you might start to say, well, does he actually have a toolbox? Does he have the tools I need to come fix this problem? And if you're talking about me, I, I don't have a toolbox, so <laughs> don't rely on me for that. And so what do you start to do? Someone promises, I'll be there tomorrow at four. You start to assess their character. Don't you? you start to say, is he really going to pull through for me on that? And have you all had people in your life who just don't pull through? They say they're going to do something. They say they're going to be there. And where are they? They take off. They're not reliable. Today in this text, our Lord says to us, I will give you life. He promises life. He promises life. And you all should sit there and say, okay, God is promising life in Christ Jesus. Is that reliable? Could I really trust God on that promise? Or is God sort of a liar? Is, does God even exist? Is, is God actually going to give me life or is am I, I going to feel bad the rest of my life? Am I going to lose my salvation? Am I going to actually get to heaven? Can God actually follow through on promises? You all know the answer, right? God cannot lie. When God promises, he will follow through all the way to the end. And this promise is based on his son and what his son did on the cross. And all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So let's look at this. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. First thing we should say here is that right here, God is speaking to us the simplest promise in the whole Bible. Usually God will say something like, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise. Here he doesn't say that. He just says, life, life. I promise you life. Now, why is that good? That's good to me because have you guys ever had a day when your mind is chaotic? You've been working all day. You don't really know what to hold on to. And you think, ah, oh, if only I had memorized some scripture. If only I could remember some of God's word, I could sort of pray right now. Paul gives us something very simple. Here's something you all can remember. Life. Our God promises life. Amen. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I, I'm, I'm busy from the day. Lord, what can I do? Just remember this word. Life, Christian. Life. God promises life. And then you can start to ask and plead the promise. Lord, did you really promise life? Do you actually exist? Is that life for me? Does it make sense that I want to die right now? And hear God saying, no child, life, life, life. What sort of life? First, new life look at verse 9 of chapter 1 
God has saved us and called us to a holy calling. He saved us. If you are a Christian and you've received the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, what do you get? New life. If you're a Christian, then you know that at one time in your life, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were like those dry bones in Ezekiel. You were dead. You were dry. You were headed to hell and you deserved it. But then God came in and said, life. And he promised new life in Christ Jesus. What does the world say, though? The world says, no, no one ever changes. When I got saved, I, I went around telling people, I once was an alcoholic, and now I'm not. I have new life in Christ Jesus. And all my friends and Alcoholics Anonymous, what do they say? No, don't say that. You can't say that. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You, you can't, no one ever changes. But we as Christians say, no, I have the promise of life in Christ Jesus. I'm new. Everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. And I could confidently say to them, I was an alcoholic. Now I have life. I've overcome. You all see that? There's more to this life, though. There's more to this promise. It speaks of new life. And secondly, it speaks of abundant life. You all remember in John 10.10 10, when our Lord says, I came that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. He's not just promising to save us. He's promising to save us and save us and save us. To take us all the way. To give us new life every day. That's wrapped up in this promise right here. Not just new life, but now Life abundantly. Life every day. Life every day. Again, what does the world say? The Christians aren't, aren't that different. You're not going to change that much. And then what do Christians say? I heard this in my first two years up in Toronto so many times. They say, well, Sam, you're in that honeymoon period. Oh, you got new life, but you know. You won't be so zealous in a few years. Has anybody ever heard that? That there's a honeymoon period in the Christian life? That's not what our text says. God promises life. And he promises it abundantly. And the word we need right here, when we talk about abundant life wrapped up in this promise, is a very vital word. Deliverance. Deliverance. And this is going to be a big theme in Paul's letter to Timothy. It's not just that you get saved, but it's what the angel said to Joseph when Jesus was born. He said, Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Plural. Matthew 1 verse 21. What's that saying? Not just that he'll get you out of death into new life, but he will save you from all of your sins. That's the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Deliverance going on throughout your life. So is anyone here, are you in a place where you've said, I'm, 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 I'm struggling with this sin. It's probably going to be there till the day I die. I'm struggling with anger. I'm struggling with lust. I'm struggling with sadness. And I've sort of plateaued as a Christian. Probably just going to be about there until I die. Don't believe it. Believe the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Look what Paul says in chapter 4, verse 18. Look at that quickly. Paul, in chapter 4, verse 18, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. That's this theme of deliverance that will come up throughout this letter. And Paul's writing to Timothy saying, Timothy, don't just plateau in your Christian life. Don't talk about some honeymoon period in your Christian life. Keep going. 
keep going. I went to deliverance meetings in Toronto twice. And there were these crazy events where people would just play music really loud. And then at the end of one of them, they actually got me into a room and tried to force me to speak in tongues. And it was, it was a weird event, but it was all based on really on emotions. The music was so loud. It was just pumping and pumping and pumping. And the thought is you come out of that night and you should be delivered somehow. There is deliverance in Christ, but it doesn't come through little parties like that. It comes through believing the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. The promise of life. That he will every day replace your sin with life. Replace your sadness with life. Replace the death and the hell in your life with life. Until the day we die. There's a promise of deliverance right here. Amen? Amen. There's something more. We have to go deeper. It's not just new life. And it's not just abundant life. But it's also eternal life. Paul here is working according to the promise of eternal life. Which is in Christ Jesus. Look in chapter 1, verse 10. He says, But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It's not just life today. And it's not just life every day. But it's eternal life. Life and immortality. What does immortality mean? Deathlessness. A state where there's no more death. Has anybody taken time to think about heaven? A place where no one will ever die? A place where there's no sin? No sadness? It seems like the chant of our world right now is, is death. Death. Everyone is fearing death. And people don't care that there's a holocaust going on in the wombs of American citizens. People don't care that the suicide rates are so high, that depression and anxiety is so high in our nation. And then you know what people do? They look around at Christians and they say, you're too heavenly minded. You're just thinking about heaven. We need Christians to claim this promise right here, the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. And we need to realize that if you are heavenly minded, you're the only way that this world is going to get helped. This world needs people who are focused on heaven, who are focused on the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul Washer often says that if you ever want to get people to look up when you're walking on the streets, just you look up yourself. Start looking at the top of the building when you're walking in Portland. Everybody around you will start going, oh, what's he looking at? That's what we should all do as Christians. Look up! The promise of life in Christ Jesus. Get your mind settled on heavenly things. Claim your citizenship in heaven, not in the United States of America. Claim your citizenship. And then those around you will say, could I have some of that? Could I get in on that promise of life which is in Christ Jesus? <clears throat> Probably won't finish this sermon today. What then do we do with promises? I really, really want to drive this home to us. What do we do with promises? <clears throat> we have to believe them. So look, if you're struggling in your Christian life, you have some work to do. You, 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 you can't just say, ah, well, I was saved by grace and now I can just do whatever the world tells me to do. We have to claim this promise. We have to meditate on this promise. We have to think of the things I've just told you. That there's new life, an abundant life, an eternal life. And then think of what Paul is doing with this promise. He's sitting there in a dungeon in Rome. 
All his friends have abandoned him. His life is not looking good and he's about to die. And he says, I'm going to believe this promise against all odds. Do you all see that? Instead of looking at the prison and my chains and the despair and impending death, I'm going to believe the promise of life in Christ Jesus against all odds. Like what Rich Mullins says, he says, I will never doubt his promise, though I doubt my heart, though I doubt my eyes. The promises of God should be more real to us than even what's right in front of our eyes. The promises of God should be more real to us than the emotions of our heart. The promises of God should be more real to us than the news and the state of the world and the state of things in Afghanistan and the state of the COVID crisis. The promises of God should rise higher than all of that and uplift us. Rich Mullins, again, you got to think about that. I will never doubt his promise, though I doubt my heart, though I doubt my eyes. And then he goes on to say, I will never doubt his promise. It's written in the skies. <clears throat> and I want to say just two more things about this. This text gives us a key to lining up our lives with this promise. Think about this, Christians, because this has actually helped me very much in the last three weeks. Take exactly what Paul says right here and apply it to your life. So, for example, today I want to go to church according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Does that work? I say yes. Amen. Go to church and it locks up with that promise of life in Christ Jesus. No? Okay. Tomorrow I want to go to work and I want to work diligently as unto the Lord, not just for men, but I'm going to work diligently and I'm going to get through those eight hours and I'm going to respect my boss and I'm going to be a good citizen according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Does that work? Amen. It does, right? Amen. Now let's try this. Oh, today, tonight, I'm going to go home and, and click on that button for porno pornography on my computer. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Does that work? No, it doesn't, it doesn't work, does it? The two don't mix. It, it doesn't work. Okay, uh, later in the week, I'm going to start complaining and I'm going to get really bitter against my spouse. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to just let my anger vent. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Does that work? Doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to run my mouth and I'm, I'm, I'm going to curse and blaspheme. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Does that work? You see, it doesn't lock up, right? But it is helpful. I, I'm, I'm just telling you this from my own experience. Drive in your car when you're coming back from work or when you're going to work and say, I want to do everything I'm doing today according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Believing all that God says in his word about life in Christ Jesus. And let me leave you with one point, final point. So this is our third point. How is this life obtained? This life is obtained through immersion. Look at our text. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, some of us might say, I believe it's true. I believe in the promise of life in Christ Jesus, but I don't feel it. It's not a reality in my life. Paul gives us right here a simple way for us to deepen our faith in this promise. A simple way for us to deepen our faith in this promise. What does he give us? He gives us a location according to the promise of life, which is where in Christ Jesus, or we could say it's a condition, the promise of life, which necessitates Christ Jesus. You need Christ Jesus for this promise. 
So what does this mean? I don't want to end this sermon without something that you can practically take home and use. If you are not saved and you don't know new life in Christ Jesus, where can you get it? In Christ Jesus. Get up in him. Get covered in him. Hide in him. Think about when you go out into the rain. What do you take? An umbrella, right? And if you want to avoid the rain, you have to be under that umbrella. Your whole body has to be covered with it. Now, a big problem in the Christian life is that we have whole limbs that are still dangling outside the umbrella. Maybe my foot's out here on this side of the umbrella. Right? There's a covering for you. You could be in Christ Jesus, but you're choosing to still hang out in the rain over here. The word to write down here is, is surrender. If you're looking to claim this promise of life in Christ Jesus, to be saved, to be new in him, you have to surrender all of your life and get it up under Christ Jesus. If you're looking to be delivered from sin in your life, okay, this anger problem, it's like a little limb dangling outside the umbrella. What do you have to do? Surrender it to Christ. Get it under Christ. And you say, how can I do that? Sam, you're not being very practical. You're talking about an umbrella. Okay, what you have to do is you have to confess it. And you have to say to the Lord, Lord, that whole part of my life, busyness, anger, the sin that still besets me, I haven't given it to you. In fact, Lord, I don't want you to have it. I want to keep it. I want to watch that, that stuff. I want to act that way. You have to start with confession. And then you have to ask the Lord for help and strength for you to surrender and get everything under Christ. This life is obtained through immersion in Christ Jesus. Well, that begins our study. We'll get to verse 2 next time. Can we praise God for the promise of life in Christ Jesus? Hallelujah. Could we ask him to make us believe it more? And to be immersed in him more day by day? And to surrender ourselves to him more? Let's pray. Lord, we bless you for this text, which is so clear and so beautiful. And we bless you for the life of the Apostle Paul, and that we can look to him, and we can get so much sustenance for our lives through him. Lord, I pray that if it's your will, you would keep us in this study and give us perseverance to hear more about what Paul has to say to Timothy and to every single one of us. Lord, let us not leave this study forgetting it, but stagger us with it, Lord. Help us go home and remember it and study this text more and ask if it reflects our life at all. Oh, Lord, comfort us and bless us and change us through your incredible word. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.